Et je voudrais remercier encore le Collège de France pour euh, euh, cette op opportunité de passer un mois ici. Et comme euh, Stanislas a mentionné, je vais rester ici à Paris pour un autre, un autre mois. So, um, last week, I discussed, <coughs> excuse me, I have a bit of cold. I hope the voice is going to be okay. Uh, let me know if you don't hear it. So, last week, I discussed the development of a multi-regional large-scale model for the primate cortex based on recently published connectomics data. And in particular, I introduced the notion of macroscopical gradients, namely some biological properties that determine, say, synaptic excitation and inhibition varies systematically along certain axes in the cortical tissue as potentially a general principle for cortical organization. Today, I'm going to uh, discuss research designed to investigate some functional questions, like the signal propagation from periphery to such a, what I call, deep recurrent network, or the interactions between top-down and bottom-up processes, and the need for gating, for a, a gating mechanism to route the information to the right place uh, flexibly, uh, de depending on behavior demand. And finally, I will, I'm going to show you an example uh, using unpublished, more recent work uh, to illustrate how such a platform can be used to look at distributed uh, cognitive processes. So one of the interesting phenomena that emerged from such a model is this uh, hierarchy of time constants. Now, if you look at this plot again, not only you see that the time scale changes from area to area, but you may notice that it can happen that sometimes the response magnitude becomes attenuated uh, dramatically, unrealistically. So that's a problem that we confronted. It's a well-known problem in neuroscience that in a uh, system with many layers, signal may not propagate you know, throughout the, system, uh, the, the whole circuit. And that, for example, has been studied in this uh, computational work where they look at how a package of spikes might or might not uh, propagate through multiple layers. And so this study, as well as many others in the past, usually use a rather simple architecture, which is a purely fit-for architecture with uh, you know, signals going from one layer to another. And also layers are all identical, all the same, right? So we thought that we need to re-examine this problem with our model, which, as you know now, that's based on rather heterogeneous connectivity data, and also with a lot of feedback projections. Right? The connections are very dense. Uh, one more time, the connections um, you know, uh, have a probability of about 65% uh, or more in this kind of network. So can we examine this kind of signal propagation in more realistic kind of setting using the uh, connectivity data from uh, Henry Kennedy's group. What's shown is a simulation here uh, where you excite V1 and watch the response of V1 and uh, part of the prefrontal cortex, uh, in this case, 24C, which is part of uh, the anterior uh, cingulate. Uh, this is a semi-log plot showing that even when the response is very rigorous in V1, sometimes the signal really doesn't go through, right? So the response here is very, very small. And then you say, oh, maybe it can scale up the global excitation to boost the signal. When that happens, sometimes if the prefrontal area is activated, through feedback projections, everything becomes unstable. So the activity basically goes through the roof. And we have to impose a ceiling at maximum response uh, around 1,000 hertz, which is not realistic in this kind of network to, um, you know, um, <clears throat> to make sure that the fine rate doesn't go to infinity, so to speak, right, for this kind of system. Um, if you take out feedback projections, the response curve as a function of the input strength, uh, as a function of the uh, global E to E coupling, not input strength in this case, becomes smoother, showing that this instability problem is uh, in, in a big part due to the feedback loops. Is there a way to solve this problem of instability? 
Well, we were inspired by a work from Ken Miller's group that proposed a few years ago for local circuit, a mechanism for signal amplification. The idea is that you enhance E to E excitation so that you can boost the response uh, in purple, but also at the same time enhance inhibition to ensure dynamical stability at the same time. So we generalize this idea to layer-to-layer -layer interactions, right? So instead of within a local circuit, now we implement this mechanism to layer-to-layer uh, -layer, uh, connections uh, that we call global balanced amplification, GBA. And we found indeed when we implement that mechanism into a large-scale model, the response in purple is greatly enhanced compared to the case in green uh, without that mechanism. Right? And this is quantified further here, showing the response from each area um, with the uh, global uh, balanced amplification in purple compared to the case uh, without it in, in green. So perhaps we can you know, be inspired by what we learned from microcircuits, but now extend it to large scale brain system. Right? To, to make sure that this mechanism is robust, uh, with spike neurons, we extended our model. Now we have, for the first time, the same model but with spike neurons. Okay? In this case, usually we find that the signal propagates very robustly without a problem um, through the ventral pathway uh, in areas indicated by blue. As you know, the ventral pathway is the pathway for very fast object recognition. It's very interesting that uh, the signal propagation is a lot more robust along this pathway <coughs> as in uh, contrast to the rest of the brain. So we looked back and found that the, the connection weights along the ventral pathway are stronger relative to the overall distribution of connection weights. Uh, so anatomically, there's a basis for very reliable signal propagation along the ventral pathway in the primate uh, uh, cortex. Now, again, if we enhance this um, 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 balanced amplification mechanism, then the signal propagation is a lot more robust, just like in the rate model. All right. Um, so from here, I think because it's a spiking network model, we could now examine a lot more interesting questions that we could not with just rate model. For example, you can ask the latency distribution, the onset of the first spike response along the hierarchy uh, that we are uh, you know, examining right now at the moment. Um, another surprising finding when we look at the signal propagation is that if you plot the response magnitude as a function of the input strength, the curve is very different for different kinds of areas. Um, especially for the prefrontal areas, like in red, there's a threshold below which the response is essentially zero. So if the input strength is over here, the activity is largely confined in the posterior part of the brain. It does not gain access to the frontal part of the brain. Whereas when the input is above the threshold, then you, the, the frontal part of the brain is activated, which in turn, through feedback projections, can enhance the global dynamics. And this threshold event uh, phenomena essentially disappears when we took out feedback projections. Right? So it's really a result of feedback loops uh, that gives you this interesting thresholding phenomena for uh, inputs to gain access to the uh, frontal areas of the brain. And that is very much similar to what is called uh, cognition, uh, sorry, ignition phenomena uh, proposed by Stanislas Dehan in uh, collaboration with Jean-Pierre Changeux and others. The idea there, their uh, global workspace model, uh, suggests that um, conscious processing and the report perhaps um, somehow is related to this all known ignition phenomena that um, is manifest by the activation of frontal areas, which again in turn would pro uh, broadcast the, the signal throughout the whole brain. Uh, so uh, that's quite interesting, um, you know, unexpected. 
that this kind of global dynamical phenomena uh, occurs in such a model. And uh, in collaboration with Stanis Lesterhan, uh, we are thinking about using this kind of model to further examine this phenomena in our model in collaboration with experimentation. So feedback loops are abundant, and their roles are still poorly understood in the cortex. Uh, what's illustrated here are the feedforward connections in the visual cortex of macaque monkey in blue and the feedback projections in red. There are now more and more speculations about what those feedback projections might be good for. One idea is predictive coding. Uh, perhaps you have heard about this idea. So the idea is that our brain is not a passive receiver of external stimulation, right? So our brains are active. We constantly try to figure out what's going to happen next by prediction, right? When you're watching a movie, for example, or watching a video, you try to infer what's going to happen next through this active predicting, uh, you know, prediction process. And that's presumably done through top-down projections to be compared with the reality, with the external stimulation. So we thought to really look at the interactions between feed-forward information processing and feedback prediction, for example, or attention or some other top-down signals, we need to incorporate layer-dependent feed-forward and feedback projections. So in the next version of the model, we incorporated layers in each local circuit. As you know, the cortex has a layered structure, and uh, physiological studies seem to suggest this kind of uh, connectivity between layers. To simplify, let's just think about the superficial layer and deep layer in each cortical area. The uh, projection from superficial layer to deep layer uh, is dominated by E to E excitation, but the feedback from deep layer back to the superficial layer um, appear to be dominated by actually uh, disynaptic inhibition. Uh, that's uh, shown over here, for example. If you look at just E to E connection between layers, from supervision layer 3 to deep layer 5, the excitation is pretty strong. But if you look, look at the excitation from layer 5 back to layer 3, basically uh, there's nothing there right, in this example. The same kind of uh, data are shown over here uh, that I'm going to skip uh, you know, in the interest of time. So it's suggesting that this kind of scheme could be a good starting point. It may not be universal, but it could be a good starting point for to incorporate a uh, structure uh, that uh, depends on layers into our model. So we took this information into consideration. And also, physiological observations from behaving animals showing that somehow the top-down signaling especially enhances uh, frequency-dependent coherence. In particular, the uh, you know, enhancement of the network uh, in the gamma, sorry, in the, in the low frequency alpha or low beta frequency range. So in the next version of the model, we have each uh, local circuit two layers, the superficial layer and deep layer. The superficial layer will show gamma oscillations whereas deep layer will show uh, alpha frequency oscillations. And the uh, connections are constrained by what I just described to you about layer-dependent interactions. The layer-to-layer -layer interactions depend on whether it's feedforward or feedback. All right? So the feedforward projections originates in the superficial layer and targets uh, superficial layer, whereas uh, a feedback projection would originate in the deep layer. But what are the targets in the recipient area remain poorly understood experimentally. So this is a question mark, would be a free parameter in our model that we can you know, tune freely. Um, this is a simulation from our model showing that when you couple the two layers, the superficial layer would show gamma oscillations with amplitude modulated by uh, alpha rhythm as shown in the, uh, uh, physiologically from this monkey experiment. Right? So we calibrated local circuit model like this from a monkey experiment, and then next asked, what does it take for us to uh, further validate um, our model in order to explain some uh, additional uh, monkey experimental observations? Uh, 
we focused on these two studies, one from Peter uh, Rothseemer and the other one from Pascal Fries. Uh, as you know, Grange causality is a measure for directed information flow from one place to another. Right? So this is a generalized uh, measure, uh, you know, frequency dependent Grange causality. And what these two studies found is that if you look at feed forward information processing, uh, there's a selective enhancement of Grange causality in the gamma range, whereas a feedback information flow instead will enhance Grange causality in the alpha range at 10 hertz. Right? So with our model, we found that we can reproduce and explain this observation if we assume that the top-down projection from deep layer would target mostly deep layer as well. Right? Under this assumption, at least qualitatively, we can reproduce this uh, grandeur causality observations. One important insight from this study is that by looking at relative enhancement of grandeur causality in the gamma frequency range, versus alpha frequency range, you can potentially de deduce whether you know, one of the two areas is lower or higher in the hierarchy, right? V1 versus V4, for example. What that implies is that you can potentially try to define hierarchy of the cortex physiologically using these kind of measurements rather than anatomically. So the same study did exactly that and validated that approach by comparing the physiologically deduced hierarchy with the anatomical hierarchy, which you can do with a macaque monkey, right? But for some other species like mice or human, for which we don't really have uh, anatomically defined hierarchy, um, you know, this study suggests that potentially we use this physiological approach to define hierarchy. So we used our model using the same procedure of analysis and showed that in our model, we can also define hierarchy that way. Right? And uh, a future study from the same group showed that indeed uh, using MEG measurements, uh, they could uh, estimate hierarchy of the cortex in humans non-invasively. Uh, the other thing that I found quite interesting is that uh, in the scenario, that feedback projection mostly targets deep layer. The model actually suggests uh, substrates for uh, predictive coding that I talked to you about the comparison between reality and the prediction. So the external stimulus, right, in any given cortical area would excite pyramidal cells in the superficial layer. Let's say this is a excitation X. Suppose that a prediction signal originated from a, a you know, higher area, right, through this feedback projection would excite pyramidal cells in the deep layer, you know, with a quantity Y, the prediction signal. But through this uh, disynaptic pathway, it reverses the sign, right? Y becomes minus Y, so it can be compared with X, as X minus Y kind of computation, which would provide a, a possible way to compute a prediction error, right? Whether the prediction is correct or not. So we are interested in exploring this possibility and potentially some other mechanisms that might realize predictive coding. Um, I think we still have to confront many other uh, challenges before we can really say that we have built a multi-regional large-scale model that uh, does a lot of interesting um, computations, performing some interesting cognitive tasks. One of the challenges I want to emphasize is this problem of uh, flexible routing of information in the brain. So as I mentioned, the connections are dense, right? So each area would get inputs from, say, 30, 40 other areas and project to many other areas. There's really absolutely no way for such a system to work without a mechanism to flexibly send information to the right place at the right time. Let me give you a very simple example. Uh, usually we integrate information from visual pathway and auditory pathway. Like what do you do now, hopefully, right? You listen to me through <coughs> your auditory pathway, and hopefully you look at me through your visual pathway, which helps communication, right? And that usually is what we do. But we don't always want to do that. So instead, for example, if you are reading a book in a noisy cafe in Paris, which I did yesterday, 
Uh, in that case, you probably want to get in information through the visual pathway and get other information through the auditory pathway so that you can focus your attention on reading, right, and not to be distracted by, by, by uh, you know, a crowd around you. So how this kind of gating can really be realized in the brain is a mystery. And how can that be controlled by behavioral context or rule signal is really a very important and uh, unresolved mystery uh, in neuroscience. So we decided to attack this problem using the dis disinhibitory circuit motif that I explained to you actually in the first lecture when we talk about working memory uh, function. So let me remind you, this is a motif that involves three kinds of inhibitor neurons, right? The first type may express PV that controls the output of pyramidal cells, and the second type may express some of the statin or carbendid that target dendrites, and so can gate information flow into the dendrites or pyramidal cells, with a third type that may be uh, expressed in VIP or carbendidin that target the blue cells. Right? So if you activate those green cells, you, the uh, blue cells might be suppressed, thereby opening the gate. Right? So this disinhibitor motif potentially can be a mechanism for what we call pathway-specific gating. Um, a graduate student, Robert Young, uh, decided to test this idea. Uh, imagine that you have a network that receives converging inputs from auditory pathway and uh, visual pathway, right? And those inputs through different pathways somehow, you know, target dendrites of pyramidal cells. And the question is, can we have this kind of mechanism to get in one pathway and, and uh, ignoring the other, right? So imagine that those two different inputs land on different parts of the dendrite, right? And if you have a way to disinhibit certain part of the dendrite, indicated by dash line through this mechanism, but not the others, then perhaps you can get in information from one particular pathway if that's behaviorally relevant, if that's behaviorally desirable, right? So Robert started with a rather realistic model of pyramidal cells with dendritic branches that have active response properties as shown here. So this is experimental observations. This is a model simulation showing this all known uh, NDA plateau potential, uh, you know, reflecting this uh, very nonlinear kind of response of dendrites in the pyramidal cells. And then he, he said, well, let's simulate the response of this kind of model neuron uh, with or without disinhibition, you know. Um, so what's shown here, uh, they assumed that the uh, input strength to this neuron um, is a bell-shaped tuning curve of a stimulus feature, like the tone frequency of auditory input, right? And, and uh, if the gate is closed, uh, you have inhibition of the dendrite, the response is very weak in black. But if you open the gate with a dashed line, then the response now is dramatically enhanced, right? So now, if you try to put inputs from the um, visual and auditory pathway at the same time, uh, if the gate is closed, uh, then the response is rather symmetrical and weak. But if you open one of this, um, you know, the gate to one of these branches, then the response is selectively enhanced. So you, you let in the input from one pathway, but you don't let in the input from the other pathway, right, in this particular example. Um, such a scenario seemed to require some kind of alignment of input that's desirable and disinhibition on the same dendritic branch, right? That's a bit uh, artificial. You say, can, you, can that happen more naturally in the real system, for example, by virtue of experience through plasticity? So to answer that question, Robert used a uh, plasticity learning rule borrowed from Gruppner and Brunel. And that's uh, very uh, solidly based on neurophysiology about spike time dependent plasticity. So, so that learning rule uh, computationally reproduced the uh, physiological observations from Sackman's group, you know, the data at the, uh, at, at the points and the curves are the simulation result from the model. And what's important in this, um, uh, for this uh, plasticity learning rule is the dependence on the activity level. 
So for example, if the activity is very low, there's no plastic change of the weight. If the activity level is moderate, actually the weight will be reduced. So we'll get weaker through long-term depression. Whereas if the uh, activity level is high enough, you can have a potentiation, so the weight will be enhanced right, through experience. Uh, what is um, in, important is that this curve depends on the modulation by dendritic inhibition. That would depend on some other state in interneurons. So if we increase dendritic inhibition from here to here to here, the curve goes down, and eventually you can actually completely abolish the LTP part so that only LTD becomes feasible. Right? Okay? And that's interesting because that suggests that in the real system, somatostatin interneurons should have a powerful role in controlling plasticity in the dendrites. Right? And so now let's imagine that initially our model does not have selectivity for uh, inputs from one pathway, so it goes to all parts of the dendritic tree. And you just um, disinhibit one branch, right, randomly chosen, and see what happens. Of course, what happens is that for this branch, because the dendrite is disinhibited, you cannot go from here to here, right? So the weight will be enhanced through LTP. With the synaptic strengths from uh, you know, the others or onto the other branches will show LTD and it will be weakened over experience. Right? Gradually, actually, there's going to be an alignment of pathway specific excitation and uh, disinhibition right? through experience. And this is what's uh, confirmed. Uh, so initially, before learning, there's no selectivity, there's no enhancement, but after learning, you have this uh, selective gating realized. Another objection that you, you can raise to this uh, proposed mechanism for gating is that uh, you kind of assume that you need this kind of disinhibitory microcircuit for each part of the dendritic branch. Is that realistic? What if the connections are rather non-specific about dendritic branches? Well, we went all the way to another extreme, look at the, the worst scenario, worst case scenario, where the connections form VIP to SST interneurons and form SST interneurons to dendritic branches are completely random with probabilities given by experimental measurements and ask, can we still have gating with this very random kind of wiring uh, you know, network? So you can quantify how good is gating? For example, you can measure the difference uh, of the response with gating minus the response uh, without gating divided by the sum. That gives you a measure of gating selectivity. So if the gating is perfect, this measure would be 1. If there's no gating, the measure would be 0. Right? You see that the, the gating selectivity is never perfect. Usually, in this case, it's about 0.5, but it's not sensitive to many parameters in this uh, random setting. Um, the only parameter that's really uh, sensitive to is the number of somatostatin interneurons that randomly target a particular dendritic branch, right? shown here. And by experimental measurement, that number is about 5 or so. And with that number, we found that the gating selectivity can still be rather good. Right? So suggesting that this mechanism of gating, or pathway specific gating, uh, in principle, can be realized biologically with, uh, you know, um, in, in the real system. Now, this scenario has been developed with a local circuit model. And we're very interested in implementing this mechanism in a multi-regional large-scale uh, brain system model. Um, very excitingly, the strength of this kind, kind of mating, gating mechanism, the abundance of such a mechanism, seem to change from area to area. Um, in collaboration with uh, Paul, <coughs> Pava Austin at Cosmin Harbor, we recently examined an anatomical database which uh, quantifies the number of garbage neurons that express uh, PV, so those are the neurons that control the output of human cells, versus neurons that express somatostatin. Those are the neurons that control the inputs onto dendrites of human cells. Um, 
What's shown here is the ratio of SST positive versus PV positive in the neurons, right? Input controlling versus output controlling in the neurons. We plotted this um, uh, graph just by this number in mice cortex. In mice cortex, there's no established, well agreed on hierarchy. But you see clearly that this ratio changes quite a bit from about 4 to like 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Right? Very interestingly, when we uh, have this plot, we found that uh, the uh, early sensory areas, like a primary visual cortex, fall off around here with low uh, number of input controlling interneurons relative to output controlling interneurons, whereas association areas, like frontal areas, are over at the top with a lot more input controlling interneurons. So this is another example of macroscopical gradient that I talked to you about last time, right? But on the side of inhibition, showing that, you know, indeed, uh, you know, um, there is a microscopical gradient in this case of input controlling versus output controlling in the neurons in the mammalian cortex. Now, it's uh, perhaps useful to mention that gating comes with multiple flavors and may be realized by multiple mechanisms. I talked to you only about input gating but it's also possible to have some specialized mechanism that controls the output of pyramidal cells from one area to uh, downstream areas, right? There's also a proposal of some kind of recurrent gating mechanism, for example, by uh, Mante, Nilsson, and uh, Susilo, <coughs> through some kind of recurrent dynamics. Of course, another gating mechanism that's been around for a long time is based on synchrony. Right, so singly at the right timing could provide another mechanism to uh, help enhance, um, you know, signal propagation along one particular pathway, but not a, another. Right. Finally, some su subcortical structures, especially basal ganglia, might also provide a mechanism for gating, which, um, um, you know, in my mind, is not going to be about pathway specific gating that I talked to you about is something else. So um, I walked you through a few steps, kind of in a construction site, so to speak, about how you know, this line of research has raised interesting new questions and how we try to address those questions. Uh, and I'd like to end basically uh, in the next uh, 10 minutes or so, telling you how we now began to use this kind of platform to investigate distributed cognitive functions. And for that, we're going to go back to our old friend mm -hmm. that we talked about in the first lecture, namely our ability to hold information and manipulate information in mind without external stimulation, uh, working memory. So there's an increasing awareness that working memory representation involves not just one particular area, but multiple brain regions, right? Uh, this is uh, promoted, this idea has been promoted in recent reviews. Uh, what's shown here for monkey and the human is just in a simple, simple, very simple delay task. Uh, during the delay period, you are required to hold the information in your mind of different types, location, contrast, shape, color, etc. Which parts of the brain uh, seem to show working memory related to signals, right? And you see that many parts of the brain are involved. And, and why and how is uh, a widely open question, right? We don't really understand how this kind of distributed working memory representation is produced and what are the functional uh, rules for this kind of uh, distributed cognition. Another uh, summary figure I like a lot from uh, Julio's um, lab is to show just num the number of publications that report delayed activity from uh, various cortical areas <coughs> in the macaque cortex. Red means papers that uh, reported positive uh, evidence for uh, working memory uh, related activity in those areas, and uh, blue indicate papers that indicate negative evidence for the presence of such a working memory signals. So the question is, why those areas 
that are engaged in working memory and not the others. So what are the rules? And can we use this kind of computational uh, you know, platform to try to understand this complicated uh, type of distributed cognition? Yeah. I'm sure there's a bias. Usually, if you don't find anything, you don't report in a paper. For example, you don't even write a paper. So there's certainly some bias. But this is just an example to illustrate that, that at least multiple brain regions have been reported to display working memory related signals. And some others seem to be less uh, engaged right, in this kind of system. Of course, this will also depend on what kind of information right, uh, we talk about in storage and what you know, type of task actually animal is engaged. There are many you know, details that's not in this graph. But I still think it's informative, it's useful to think about and raise the question, right? How to understand distributed representation of working memory. Um, uh, just to say that really when we go beyond local circuit, um, there are a lot of unknowns, right? I want to start with a very simple model with two areas. It's actually widely reported in many, many studies that the prefrontal cortex and the posterior parietal cortex very often show similar kind of neural signals, right, in cognitive processes. So uh, in a recent paper, we decided to look at a loop model with just two areas. Each one is built a bit like what I told you about, with two neuron pools selected for two you know, neuron stimuli, A versus B. And now we have a loop interactions between the two areas. All right? And ask, you know, now, can we look at persistent activity in this loop model? Well, just to say that you can pretty much get a similar kind of persistent activity in both areas in multiple ways. So in the first possibility in green, um, if you disconnect the two areas, each of the two can show delay activity. What's shown here is basically the strength of recurrent excitation in each local circuit that's required to generate persistent activity, right? So in this example, each of the two has strong enough recurrent excitation to show sustained activity uh, by itself without the help from the other, right? Now, uh, in another scenario, no of them show delay activity by itself, but through this long distance connection loop, you can get persistent activity, right, in the purple case. Now, in the third case, only one of the two show, you know, by itself, when isolated, has the strength to show persistent activity, but the other one is not, right? And yet, when you connect them, both will show delay activity, so this area would show delay activity just reflecting persistent input from the other area. Right? So just by watching the persistent activity pattern in the intact system, you would not be able to tell whether the system is you know, uh, realized using one of the three possible scenarios. And this is just for two areas. Imagine that you have hundreds of areas you know, with very complicated connectivity scheme uh, it's no trivial, right, how we can come about um, trying to understand um, the underlying mechanism for distributed persistent activity patterns. Of course, for this example, we could, uh, you know, look at other things to differentiate the differential functions of those two areas. For example, you, uh, you, we found that um, if you require that um, the response to a distractor during the delay period is really strong in PPC but not PFC, that uh, uh, we conclude that both areas are capable of persistent activity by themselves, but the, the one in PP, PFC is more robust. Okay? If you block the connections between the two, then the system will not be able to resist distractors that we talk about again in the first lecture. So now let's use this large-scale model in which each local circuit is uh, implementing this local circuit model with two selective neuron pools. That's fully nonlinear, right? Again, each local circuit has these two selective neuron pools, just like what I talked to you about in the first lecture um, uh, you know, about decision-making and working memory. 
um, and, and ask if we now have a gradient of re uh, strength of excitation in such a system, what kind of distributed persistent activity pattern might emerge in such a system? For the rest of the uh, simulation results, I actually assume that in each of these local circuits, the connection strength is sufficiently weak that there's no persistent activity if isolated from the rest of the network. Right? Even PFC in the following simulations will not be able to generate persistent activity by itself. That's a model assumption, which may not be true. Actually, I kind of don't believe uh, that that's the case. I believe that in the real system, some local circuits by themselves will be able to generate persistent activity. But let's first assume that none of the local circuits can produce persistent activity. So whatever you see right, in the following slides will be a result of the feedback projections between areas right, in this large scale system. So here's a simulation. Actually, let me show this plot as well, where we uh, give a brief input to V1. So V1 generates very rigorous response during the stimulus presentation as well as MT. Uh, what's shown here is the activity map. So the activity level is shown in color. And this is the activity map during stimulus presentation. Right? You see that the activity is mostly confined in the posterior part of the brain. And when the input is gone, the activity is gone in V1 as well as in MT but not in LIP, part of the posterior parietal cortex, and some parts of the prefrontal cortex. And that's shown here in the activity map. During the delay period, when the input is no longer uh, you know, present, the activity still persists in those areas, right? showing this distributed person activity pattern. Um, if you plot the fine rate for each of the areas against the hierarchical position of those areas, you see that those areas that don't show delay activity are over here, separated by areas that show delay activity by a gap. I think this is another example of what I call bifurcation, namely a graded change of parameters give rise to a qualitative change of behavior. In this case, the emergence of person's activity in space. Right? So the parameters are embedded in space, if you like, and there's this robust bifurcation across the uh, spatial network of the cortex for the emergence of distributed person activity pattern. Now, having established this, you could imagine that this model could be used to examine uh, many different questions. Uh, this days, for example, experimentally, you can use optogenetic method, at least in rodents right now, to some extent in primate uh, species as well, to inactivate certain cortical area and ask what's the impact of that inactivation on the distributed uh, function or dynamics, right? So you can ask what happens given this person activity pattern, if I inactivate, you know, or lesion, quote unquote, um, one area in this model uh, to the system behavior. So what's shown here is sequentially inactivating more and more areas, um, you know, going down the hierarchy. And what we found is that uh, actually the person activity is rather robust. Even if you take out five or six areas, the person activity pattern remain more or less intact, okay, uh, by and large, suggesting that there's a very strong robustness for this kind of robot distributed working memory representation, and that may be one advantage for the distribution to be distributed rather than localized only in one microcircuit, right? Uh, another question you can ask is, what kind of self-sustained persistent activity patterns really exist in this kind of system, right? So for that, it's not obvious how you can really discover, so to speak, all kinds of uh, uh, attractive states. Because just by stimulating V1, you may not be able to find all the activity patterns that are different, are self-sustained, and distributed differently across space. Right? So we developed a mathematical way to identify attractive states. Here are six possible examples uh, showing self-sustained uh, activity patterns 
that are involving different parts of the brain. Right? This is very localized example. This is another example involving a small parts of the frontal lobe and a small parts of the temporal lobe, etc. Right? So there are many hidden attractor states that are exist that exist that we probably didn't know before. Right? Using this model, we could start to uh, really try to uh, discover you know, those kind of attractive states. Now you think about it, those internal states might be relevant to many interesting behavioral and cognitive functions. Right? When you do a math problem, when you think, those involve internally sustained you know, activity patterns. Right? So why not? Those, are, those patterns might be involved for different cognitive functions. We don't know. Um, so uh, if you start with a control case with, say, 15 interesting attractor states, now you ask, if you do lesion to one of the areas, how many attractor states would still exist, right? uh, remain intact? This is a different question from the one I told you before. The one I told you before is that given the person's activity pattern, if we, I gradually lesion more and more areas, does that attractor state still uh, remain? Right? Here I'm asking a different question. I have 15 different interesting attractor states, and I take out one area at a time. How many attractor states still remain intact? Okay? And we found that if you take out one area in early in the hierarchy, actually you don't do much to the collection of attractor states, but the areas um, higher in the hierarchy have a much bigger impact on the collection of attractor states. Actually, those are the areas that are part of what's called a core of the cortical system. So, um, and this is an anatomical analysis from, uh, again, Kennedy's group, showing that uh, in this kind of densely connected network, there are some areas that you know, form some kind of a bow tie uh, at the core of um, you know, cognitive control of sensory information processing on one end and the motor output on the other end. And those are the areas in our model are the ones that have the biggest impact on the distributed attractor states. Um, let me summarize. So yesterday, or rather last week, uh, I, I, I talked to you about how to go from structure to dynamics and how a hierarchy of time constants emerges for such a system. And um, again, I think the idea of micro, uh, microscopical gradients uh, may be rather useful uh, by looking at how such a system is organized in spite of uh, a wide diversity of heterogeneities across cortical areas. And uh, today, I started to talk to you about an extension of such a model that builds a laminar structure, which suggests a potential substrate for uh, predictive coding. And this is just an idea, and we, we are still uh, beginning to uh, examine this possibility. And then um, I mentioned this problem of um, gating, which again um, is quite important to understand, and we proposed a pathway-specific gating mechanism that depends on, in particular, some other certain uh, expressing interneurons, and maybe VIP interneurons that may open the gate. Right? A radical hypothesis, but a testable prediction, is that control signals from higher up, wherever that is, right, that represent rule, that represent behavior context, should act on those interneurons rather than exciting pyramidal cells. Okay? And that prediction can be tested uh, experimentally. <clears throat> and finally, I provided an example of a distributed uh, cognitive process, uh, you know, showing you how uh, such a system may be used to look at the distributed working memory representation. And, and again, uh, using this idea of microscopical gradients. I would say, as you can see, right, it's really um, a tool of construction side. Uh, a lot of um, fun comes from formulating questions rather than trying to 
solve the problem in one uh, step. And I think this is uh, opening up uh, perhaps uh, a new direction uh, that we and others intend to pursue. Let me thank people who uh, made big contributions to the work I shared with you. Uh, again, Rishi uh, started to develop uh, the dynamic model of uh, uh, macaque cortical circuit model in collaboration with Francis Song. Robert uh, is part of uh, multiple parts of this uh, story. Together with uh, uh, Maddie, for example, they worked on signal propagation. Uh, Ho Hei um, built this layered version of the model in collaboration with Henry Kennedy. Thank you very much.